Hey, Randy Joe here, and this is 1000 Reviews, the series where I plan on reviewing every single album from the 1000 Albums Listened To Before You Die book. And today we're looking at Sonic Youth's 1990 album, Goo. Goo was released underneath the DGC label, produced by Nick Sansano, Sonic Youth, and Ron St. Germain, with art direction from Kevin Regan, Nationality USA, and a running time of 49 minutes and 23 seconds. This might be a bit of a longer review, so I'll just skip the introduction. You already know who Sonic Youth is probably at this point. Um, and just right away, I want to say that this album is fantastic, even though this is considered Sonic Youth accessible album, which with the opener Dirty Boots, it's easy to see why, as its overall tone and sound is much more accessible than most of what's on this album and definitely fits to a more radio friendly centric audience but still it's overall almost nonsensical lyrics definitely leave it to be something worth examining and something worth looking deeper into. But I think if you do look into the lyrics, it's pretty easy to kind of come up with a similar interpretation to most with the fact that lyrics like jelly roll, crack, uh, Satan on the finger, finger on her love, Satan got her tongue, and all these similar sort of phrasing seems to allude to sexual acts or at least a sexual lifestyle throughout that either the narrator of this track or Thurston Moore himself seems to enjoy well on the road. At least that's how I interpret it. However, I do like that despite this track being a pretty up-tempo track overall, it does have these very subtle moments of slowness kind of sprinkled in, especially towards the end of the track, that overall make this five-minute track feel a bit more varied and welcoming. And moving on from Dirty Boots, going on to the third and fourth track, I'm gonna skip the second one and save that for last. The third and fourth track, Merry Christ and Cool Thing, dive more into the accessible sound and style that Dirty Boots sort of laid down. With Merry Christ, you have just this great punk track that does what all punk tracks should do and be very direct and visceral and just straight to the vein with their approach and style. And on top of that, it doesn't drag on too long and keeps things quite concise to really give you that one-two punch that great punk music should. And even though lyrically, this song is very simple, just about a date that Thurston Moore had with a girl when he went ice skating with her, the simplicity of this track and the very simplicity of the lyrics definitely fit quite well with this punk rock aesthetic. Before easing off into the subtle riff that closes out this track, and then opens right into the next cool thing, which apparently this track stems from a interview or a, a difficult interview, I should say, between singer Kim Gordon from Sonic Youth and LL Cool J, where the two of them struggled to find some common ground between each other, and Kim Gordon seems to imply that politically they were on two opposite ends of the spectrum, and throughout this track, she's basically knocking LL Cool J down a peg and also knocking down any male artist or just males in general who feel as if they run the world and they are some sort of God's gift to women. This is a pro-feminist track, but at the same time, it is quite satirical and poking fun at the politics of men and women. This sort of satire creates a nice comedic and humor-esque tone throughout the track that is quite welcome, especially after the heavy second song on this album, Tunic, which like I said, I will go back to at the end of this review. And even though this album is often put up as some sort of accessible piece of music from Sonic Youth and them selling out to some people, um, that couldn't be further from the truth because yeah, with tracks like Dirty Boots, Cool Thing, and Merry Christ, uh, yeah, they're more accessible, but at the same time, I could just as easily point to tracks like Moat, Mildred Pierce, and Scooter and Jinx, which are just the furthest from uh, accessible you could pretty much go on this album. First off, you have the track Moat, which is over seven minutes long, already length being an issue for most people. And so with this over seven minutes long track, you have just this incredibly dense second half that is so full of noise and so explosive that I would say it's definitely not at all accessible to most. Lyrically, it's pretty nonsensical and seems to stem from a Sylvia Plath poem known as I Moat. However, the lyrical content and even the vocals aren't necessarily what I love and adore about this track. It is the freak out nature of the second half. 
because overall the instrumental gets more and more out there and more zany and more explosive and layered than anywhere else on this album with these guitar amps revving up and these guitars as well giving a lot and I mean a lot of feedback throughout just scratching and going out of control underneath these vocals before it takes over in the second half and this second half becoming more noisy and dissonant than ever before with the pummeling drums that just feel as if they are beating you eventually they are not even keeping a certain steady beat of any sort it just feels as if you were being attacked like an onslaught of drumming alongside this just wailing out of control guitar work these shimmering chimes that sort of come in and out of play as well kind of shimmering back and forth into the mix and then also just beeping sounds tossed in for extra measure to continue to add to this noisy in sound collage soundscape that is the second half of moat this entire second portion of the track to me just gets increasingly better and better as time goes on and even though it might not be enjoyable to most i think for music fans this is something that will definitely hook you in and bring some sort of appeal just for its overall absurdity and strangeness you could definitely feel the velvet underground influences that sonic youth takes in this track and moving on from that one going on to another uh not so accessible track you have the eighth track mildred pierce which is two minutes and starts off pretty simple it's nothing too extreme it's just you know some classic great um i would say punk-ish themed music you know with moat you can argue that there was a bit of dancing around noise it wasn't going all the way with it like velvet underground might have or a lot of bands do today but with mildred pierce they do not dance around noise rock but rather just dive headfirst right into it with thurston moore's vocals just screaming at the top of his lung and distorting out of control these Mildred Pierce lines, repeating Mildred Pierce over and over just very simply. Um, lyrically is not the most dense of tracks, but vocally and performance wise, I think is absolutely brilliant. And alongside these out of control uh, wails from Thurston, you have the overall instrumentation, which is absolutely insane. I mean, this just pushes all sounds to the limits at this point, and it's just a wall of sound, to be quite honest with you. And I think what really makes this track for me is just the very sudden cutoff at the end, as the vocals, instrumentation, all of it hits to a instant silence. It kind of gut punches you in a way with how it breaks off. It's sort of like an amp turning off and all sounds just collapsing in on itself. It is a fantastic track. It is only two minutes long and is straight to the vein, just absolutely enjoyable bonkers noise rock that I adore. And this track, apparently during the recording process, they also managed to get the song Scooter and Jinx out of it, the 10th track on this album, which is just a minute long of cranked up amps pushed to their limits. And even though it might not be that interesting of a song to most, the one minute dissonant amp sounds are quite enjoyable to a, again, a noise fan like myself. I find the song Cinderella's Big Score to be possibly my least favorite of the entire track list as it just feels as if it has something left to be desired. I'm not quite sure what it is with this track that seems to be missing the mark. Uh, I mean, it carries all the great staples of most of Sonic Youth's music in this album, but it does, doesn't feel like it's living up to the potential of many of the other tracks on here and not reaching the heights of the experimental nature, nor is it being as accessible as the other tracks such as Dirty Boots is on this album. But now wheeling things back to the track I have danced around throughout this entire review so far is the second one, Tunic, Song for Karen. I love this song. I have listened to it many, 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 many times over the course of one week and I think it is just absolutely brilliant and easily my favorite Sonic Youth song on this album. And it's just pure genius, I would say, as it is a tribute track to Karen Carpenter from The Carpenters and her overall untimely and depressing death from anorexia. And it dives into the themes of anorexia and lyrically dives into them as well with Kim Gordon's beautiful voice as well being the driving force of these lyrics. At the time, anorexia in the early 80s when Karen passed away wasn't that well-known or well-researched 
and unfortunately ended up taking Karen's life. And this track feels as if it handles that in a very tasteful way while at the same time carrying on a very depressive note. Here you have Karen in the afterlife saying hello to all her heroes, Elvis, Dennis Wilson, Janis Joplin, and it is really depressing with lyrics of her mentioning her playing the drums again in heaven and looking down and seeing her brother, Richard, and lyrically carrying on lines that are just so raw and direct and to the point, but at the same time, cryptic enough to keep you engaged. Lyrics like, I feel like I'm disappearing, getting smaller every day, but I look in the mirror, I'm bigger in every way. If you know anything about anorexia, you would understand that you continue to starve yourself and get smaller and smaller and more frail than ever before, while at the same time when looking in the mirror, you have this image of yourself that you are continually actually getting bigger. This dysphoria that Karen suffered from would continue to have this effect of her believing she is more overweight than she actually is and would eventually lead to her death. And even though this track is pretty emotional and pretty light and airy, the four minute mark is when this dark and brooding atmosphere really takes hold and feels very disturbing with the overall instrumentation becoming more and more hectic than anywhere else on this song. There's these distant wails as well, almost like these whisperings of sort that just add to this very eerie and ghost-like tone, feeling like Karen is in the afterlife and you are hearing the afterlife as a listener. These shimmering guitars as well add to this afterlife sort of tone and create even deeper into a really eerie atmosphere. The content of this track, the lyrics of the track, performance from Kim Gordon, the instrumentation, all of it to me is just absolutely perfect. There is nothing wrong with this track. It is by far my favorite on the album and it's just emotional weight paired alongside with just the brilliant execution makes this a must listen track for sure. Especially with just overall how tasteful this track still remains and feels as a tribute to a legend, Karen Carpenter. So with that being said, this album to me is absolutely brilliant. I love, love, love this thing quite a bit. The soft rating of the album came to an 8.5 out of 10, but I will harden that rating up to a nine out of 10. It is absolutely brilliant. And with only a couple tracks here and there, not quite doing it for me as much as the others, I would say that this is still a brilliant album through and through and definitely worthy of a listen. So it gets a E for essential. Definitely listen to it. It has a place in this book for sure. Next album we are listening to is Random Number Generator 1 to 1001, Generate 532, which will be the album 532 being Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Welcome to the Pleasure Dome. I will review that in about one week from now. Anyways, that pretty much does it for this video. If you like the video, please hit like and subscribe if you want to follow along and listen to every album from the 1001 albums listened to before you die book. And as always, my name is Randy Joe, and I'm signing off.